Acts chapter 16. If you are at Acts 16, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. All right, we are there. Uh, my emphasis will be from verse 11 to 36, but for reading's sake, we are going to read from verse 16. Uh, we do some uh, picking, we'll pick some verses, we'll jump some, but that is a whole period of it. But I'll begin from verse 16, and when I go to the next one, I'll let us know. I read from the New International Version, Acts chapter 16, verse 16. It says, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Let's go to verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaking. Once all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up. When he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself! We are all here. Let's go to verse 31. They reply, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. Verse 36, the last verse. The jailer told Paul, the magistrate have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. Father, we thank you for the privilege given unto us to hear from you once again. We trust you that the door of all trances will remain open. The door of faith, the door of ministry will remain open. Let your word come to us and speak to us in accent you want us to understand. At the end, O oh God, give us the grace to do your will. And may your name be exalted. Lord, I thank you for choosing me to be the vessel to use. And I pray at the end, may you increase the more as I will decrease the more. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. This morning, I, I struggle with the topic to give my message, but I decided to settle with this. But the word I'm using, I'm not trying to say, although it has a sense of duty, but I think, yeah, it should have the sense of duty, but I'm not saying it should be like a ritual. So I title this message, The Obligation of the Gospel Minister. The Obligation of the Gospel Minister. The word obligation have some synonyms which will mean duty, requirement, and some synonyms will mean uh, a kind of promise. So I would like to go with the word promise, which will be better for this uh, devotion this morning. The passage we read, the whole pericope is from Acts chapter 16 verse 11. And there we read the story of a woman called Lydia. 
This woman gave her life to Christ. Her heart was open to the gospel. And she received Christ and she was transformed. She did so many good things because of that encounter. But the devil was not happy with her choice. And he tried to fight back through bringing so many dangers across the way of Paul and Silas, those whom God has used to minister to this woman called Lydia. Satan attacked them through the slave girl. We see the slave girl, she's a fortune teller. The Bible says, whatsoever thing she say concerning Paul and Silas was true, but under the influence of demonic spirit. And we need to understand that just because people are saying something and it's true does not mean they are under the influence of God. There are many people who claim to be prophets, who claim to be the men of God today in Africa, and that is actually the bane of Christianity in Africa. They claim to be called by God, they tell us fortune, they predict the future, and what they are saying is true. I do hear some pastors, even in the seminary, will tell me, these people, what they are doing is working for them, just because it works for them. It does not mean it is right. That's why every Christian needs to have the spirit of the sun man, to understand those who are under the influence of the spirit of God and those who are used by the enemy. The Bible said everything he said about them was true, but under the influence of demonic spirit. And that called the gospel ministers and the church today to be watchful and to ask God to give us a grace to have that spirit of discernment so we can know what is right and what is wrong. And one good thing about the story of this young girl, the Bible said it is not her parents, her owners, those who are using her for money making. There are some people who will be happy with your disadvantage because your pain is a benefit to them. Your challenges is a benefit to them. And they want you to remain in that cage of ignorance. And I see some pastors today putting their members on that cage. They don't want them to know the truth of the gospel. They don't want to reveal this truth of the gospel. They keep them under bondage, under ignorance, so they can benefit from their disadvantage. There are people who are your friends just because there are some benefit they get from you. Once those benefits are no longer there, they cease to be your friends. And we see that with the story of this girl. This girl was under bondage because her bondage was an advantage to some people. They are getting money, making money from a disadvantaged situation. And I pray that we will not be such pastors that will use the ignorance of our members for our own advantage. We will not be such men of God that will want to catch them, put them in ignorance to make money out of their disadvantaged situation. Paul and Silas got into trouble by obeying God's command. They did what God asked them to do, and that get them into trouble. Just because you help people does not mean you are free from trouble. Just because you are doing the right thing does not mean you are free from challenges. Just because you are called by God does not mean you are secure from the troubles of life. And so, they did the right thing and that get them into trouble. Sometimes, your good deeds can attract challenges to your life. Sometimes, your good attitude can bring troubles your way. But what are the obligations that we, we are going to see from Paul and Silas? What do we see should be our promise, our requirements, as we are called by God? What is God expecting us to do as ministers? The first obligation for me that we can see from that passage in Acts chapter 16, verse 16 and 25, is the obligation of prayers. The obligation of prayers. The pastor, the man of God, you are obliged to pray. Paul and Silas prayed. The Bible said they were on their way for prayers and they encounter this challenge. But do you know something good about them? The location has changed, but the intention never changed. Their intention was to pray. Although the location of the prayer has changed, no longer at the temple, but in the prison, and yet they still prayed. Jesus Christ taught his disciples how to pray. There is no minister that will succeed in this ministry without prayers. We need to pray because Jesus prayed. I ask myself a question. Why would Jesus pray? Because Jesus is God. What is he praying for? To whom was he praying to? Jesus was praying to show us examples that we need prayers. Jesus was not praying for material gains. He was not praying for material benefits. But I know he prayed to tell us that prayer is a communion with the Father. It's relationship with our Father. We need to have time to pray. Paul and Silas did not pray against their enemies or against those who hurt them. But they prayed for them. 
they prayed for them. And I understand one of the easiest way to forgive your offenders is to pray for them, not to pray against them. It is easier for you to forgive those people who hurt you when you pray for them. As pastors, maybe you have somebody, a member in the church, or a deacon, and you feel this man is hurting me. What God expects from you, your obligation is to pray. Prayer is like a mirror that gives us a true reflection of who we are. When I stand to pray and I say, God, you are righteous, then I ask myself a question, am I righteous? If I say, God, you are holy, I ask myself a question, am I holy? If I say, God, you are good, I ask myself, am I good? If I say, God, you are kind, I then reflect on myself, am I kind? Prayer is like a mirror that tells us a true reflection of who we are. Prayer is not an opportunity for you to tell God to do what he does not want to do. But prayer is a place of surrender. Prayer is a place to do the will of God. In this generation, we find it difficult to hear Christians praying for the will of God. But Jesus prayed for the will of God. Paul and Silas prayed for the will of God. Brethren, they were not even praying for their freedom. But they were praying for the freedom of others. Because they understand they themselves were free. It was the jailers and other people there that were not free. And so they prayed for them, they never prayed against them. Prayer is saying the words of adoration and allowing those words to, to reflect in our life. So God expects us to pray. Don't let your challenges distract you from prayers. You are called to pray. Jesus called them to follow him, to teach them how to pray. And that was one thing he told his disciples, how to pray. We must pray. We must pray for Nigeria. I met a friend yesterday and the friend said, I don't know what we are praying for. We said we should pray. What should we pray for? We are expected to pray for the will of God. We must continue to trust God that His will will be done in our nation, Nigeria. Prayers does not change the will of God. It does not change the mind of God. But prayers changes you. Prayers changes you. Prayers connect you with God and help you to understand the purpose and plans of God for your life. Prayers has nothing to do with ours. It has nothing to do with grammar. It has all to do with connection with the Heavenly Father. What are you praying for? Do you pray for people who hurt you or against them? How are you praying? How do you pray? Do you spend time to pray? God expects us to pray. Paul and Silas, we are, we are prayer leaders. And God expects us to also pray. The second obligation, quickly, that I see from the life of Paul and Silas, just from this context, from the passage we read, is the obligation to praise. In Acts chapter 16, verse 25, the Bible said, Paul and Silas praise God. They praise God in their bitter situation. God expects us to praise Him. And what is praises in the sense of this context? For me, I see praises to mean that when we praise God, we are saying, God, we believe your promises. We trust your promises for our life. We are not doubting your promises for us. Despite our challenging situation, despite the bitter experience, God never changed. Despite what is happening, He still keeps His promise. Only man can promise and fail, but God never promise and fail. And when I praise God, I am saying, God, I thank you because you fulfill your promise in my life. And also, when we praise God, it's a sign, it's an evidence that we are free spiritually. Paul and Silas, despite being in chains, they praise God because they know their spirit is not in chain and the gospel is not in chain. So, just because we are physically chained or we are in challenging situation does not pick, put the gospel under that challenging situation. The gospel is free and so they decided to praise God. When we praise God, it's evidence that we know that what we are doing is pleasing to God. And so we praise God because we are pleasing to Him. Paul and Silas praise God because they know what they did is pleasing to God. And also when we praise God, is a sign of thanksgiving. One way to tell God, thank you, is to praise Him. When you are praising God, you are thanking God. And when we praise God, it's a sign of contentment. Contentment does not mean you should not have plans. It does not mean you should not have dreams. But contentment is just saying, I don't need more to be happy. I have Jesus. And Jesus is enough for me to be happy. You know, we are in a generation that people think that Jesus alone is not enough. You must add something to Jesus for it to work. Jesus plus anointing oil. Jesus plus handkerchief. Jesus plus the toe, Jesus plus candle, Jesus plus... I don't know if you have seen one anointed, anointed honey. 
Jesus plus anointed honey, Jesus plus water. They felt that Jesus is not enough. But when you praise God, it's evident that you know, my God is enough for me. I don't need more. Jesus is enough for me. What is happening to you is not as important as what is happening in you. Though they were in prison physically, but their soul was not in prison, and they praise God. Your problem is not what people are doing to you. It's not the persecution we are receiving. Your problem is how you respond to what people are doing to you. Never let your prison stop you from praising God. Despite that prison, whatsoever the prison might be, praise God in that prison. Despite the night that you are in, I don't know the night you are in, it might be the night of agony, the night of rejection, the night of pain, or you are in the night of struggling for school fees, what to eat. Praise God in that night. God gave Paul and Silas a new song in their night. And I believe God is going to give you a new song in your night. God is giving us a new song in our night. Always do what pleases God, even if other people misunderstand you. If you don't even understand, if that is pleasing to God, do it. The third obligation, which is the last one. In Acts chapter 16, verse 31 to 33, we see another obligation of the gospel minister is to preach the word. To preach the word. Paul and Silas preached the word to this jailer. The Bible says when the jailer discovered that the prison were broken as a result of the earthquake, you know, earthquake is very terrible. If you see what is happening in Syria and Turkey, recently you will know the effect of earthquake. So when that happened, the jailer was ready to kill himself because he knew the consequence if a prisoner escaped and the jailer on duty must be punished. Some scholars said they would tie the dead body to the jailer. You will be walking around the street until you die. That's part of the punishment. And so he was ready to execute himself, not allowing himself to pass through that shame and that trouble. So Paul and Silas gave him hope. The jailer concluded, there is no hope for me, but the word of God, the gospel they preach, give that man hope. We are in a hopeless world. Some people felt there is no hope, but there is hope in Jesus Christ. There are many people who felt that their situation is hopeless. Satan have told them that there is no hope out of their situation. But brethren, there is hope in Jesus Christ. We need to preach this word. This is the gospel we need to tell them. Paul and Silas told the jailer, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You and your household will be saved. That is the gospel. That is what we need to preach. That is what we need to guard. That is the gospel that God has called us to do. And that is our obligation. We are called to preach the gospel and not ourselves. We are called to make Jesus popular and not ourselves. We are called to give answer to the answerless society. We are called to give hope to the hopeless society. We are called to give meaning to the meaningless society. Our world is full of meaningless things, but God is saying there is meaning in Jesus Christ. Their gospel was Christ-centered, it was not man-centered. And when they declared the gospel to the jailer, the Bible said the jailer received the gospel. The jailer did not only receive life, he also found life in Jesus Christ. And that is the greatest miracle that I see in this passage. The jailer and others were the real prisoners, not Paul and Silas. That was why they are the ones that needed freedom. And they are the ones that Paul and Silas prayed for. And they are the ones that Paul and Silas preached the gospel to because they needed that gospel. Brethren, God expects us to preach the gospel. What are you preaching? What are you preaching? What kind of gospel are you preaching? What is the motive of what you are preaching? We are called to preach Christ and only Christ. That is the power of the gospel. And that is the only gospel that can give life. There are many people who are ready to kill themselves. They are tired of this world. They are tired of the circumstances. They are tired of their situation. There is no hope in their life. They have concluded nothing good is coming out from my life. The only hope for them is this gospel. You are called to preach this gospel. And that is why Jesus called the disciples. The Bible says when he called them, in the passage where we took our call to worship, come, I will make you fishers of men. What was he doing with them? From this passage where we read today, he called them to teach them how to pray, to teach them to praise God, and to teach them to preach the word. And after he left, they practiced what he taught them. You don't need to understand God before you obey him. Carry out your obligation and God will do the rest according to his own will. You need to pray 
Praise God and preach. You know, we say we are going to be praising God in heaven forever and ever. But I don't know why we are not practicing that on earth. So we need to praise God. When Paul and Silas carried out their obligation, God did his own part. What did God do? God demonstrated his power in three ways. He delivered the slave to girl that was possessed by demons. He sat and he set an earthquake to deliver Paul and Silas from the prison. And he saved that jailer and his family. When we carry our obligation, God will also play his own part. Let us pray. I want you to talk to God this morning. We have seen what God is telling us from the passage read. Ask God to help you to pray in all situations. Ask God to help you to keep giving thanks as an evidence of your praises to Him. I will not stop praising you. Don't let your praises stop you from praising God. Don't let your challenges stop you from praising God. Don't let what is happening to you stop you from giving thanks to God. Can you pray and also God say, God, I trust you to help me to preach this gospel. There are many people who are in need of the power of this gospel. They need this gospel. The only thing that will give us hope is the gospel. Can you pray, God, give me the needed revelation, understanding to preach your word in the right perspective. Kaini gaskya kaini rei Kaini hainya unuba Ni zambika arabata Kaini gaskya kaini rei Kaini hainya unuba Ni zambika Oh uh -huh. 